Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll provide some important updates on both education and health. First, I want to remind folks that I have extended the state of emergency for another month. Again, this is a tool we need in order to continue to manage the public health risks of the pandemic, which has not gone away despite our success here in Vermont. Dr. Kelso, our state epidemiologist, is in for Dr. Levine today and she'll provide an update on the outbreak, clusters, and cases we're following. Notably, the outbreak related to adult and youth hockey leagues here in central Vermont. First, I want to note that we're considering a number of steps to strengthen guidance, particularly around off-the-ice activities in interstate play. We also need all players and families to abide by the strict guidance we already have in place. We talk a lot about the importance of staying vigilant, and I know that by talking so much about it, and while we continue to have success here in Vermont containing the virus, I worry that Vermonters are not listening to the message as intently as before. But I hope folks will listen carefully today as Dr. Kelso talks about the hockey outbreak in particular, because it does tell a story. Importantly, our contact tracing team is on top of this and will contain it just the way we have every other outbreak. But again, please don't let the, this lull you into complacency. I think each outbreak should be seen as a learning experience for both my team and for Vermonters, so we get a better understanding as to how we can slow the spread while living our lives in this new reality. Because if we want to keep businesses and schools open, if we want our kids playing sports, and if we want to be able to get back together with family and friends, all of which is really important to our mental health and social well-being, we have to be smart about how we do it. As an example, Dr. Kelso is going to share some tips for a safe Halloween. But I hope, uh, what I hope you take away from this, in addition to how to have a safe Halloween, is that, again, we can have some sense of normalcy, as long as we recognize it's not going to be exactly like last year, and we use common sense to prevent spreading the virus. Believe me, I understand how hard it is to keep this up for seven months. But here's what's important to remember. The smarter we are about how to do the things we all want to do, the better off we'll be. So while small gatherings are okay, they still need to be done using precautions, like wearing masks and keeping six feet apart. But we've got to avoid gathering in large crowds, traveling from red counties without quarantining, even sharing food at these types of events can be risky. By doing things a little differently and being smart and cautious, we can stay open, continue sending our kids to school, and even seeing some family over the, over the holidays. And we'll keep ourselves in a position to come through this pandemic faster and on better economic footing than states who have lost countless lives seeing their health care systems pushed to the brink and who have had to roll back their reopenings. And as we work to make sure we come out of this stronger than before, we also need to stay focused on getting Vermonters back to work to fill jobs that are open and available today. So I'm pleased uh, to have President Joyce Judy from the Community College of Vermont here with us today to talk about a new offering that will help displaced workers train for new careers. While this pandemic continues to be devastating for workers, particularly in the hospitality sector, this program could help thousands gain the skills they need for new careers, filling the many jobs we had available well before the pandemic. This will be a win-win for our workers and employers, and it's one of the ways we can make our economy more resilient in the future. I also want to give credit where credit's due and recognize Representative Gene O'Sullivan and the House Commerce Committee for introducing this initiative, which provides $3 million to CCV for this important program. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to President Judy for more details. Thank you, Governor. And as president of the Community College of Vermont, I am also here representing the Vermont State College system. And I appreciate the chance to let Vermonters know about a very unique and exciting opportunity that is available through the four colleges. As many of you know, CCV is part of the Vermont State College system, along with Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Technical College. And thanks to the $2.3 million allocation by the Vermont Legislature from the federal Corona Relief Funds and with support from the Governor, I have some really good news for all Vermonters whose employment has been impacted by COVID-19. CCV, as well as the other members of the Vermont State Colleges, are pleased to announce that we will be offering free college, college courses and training for the next two months to all Vermonters whose work or household situation has changed because of the pandemic. As the governor said, this idea originated in the House, Commer House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development under Chair Mike Marcotte and Vice Chair Gino Sullivan's leadership, and then was championed in the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs by Chair Michael Sorotkin and Vice Chair Allison Clarkson. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Vermont Department of Labor for partnering in this effort. So if you or someone in your household has been laid off, furloughed, had your hours cut, or you've been employed in an industry that has been impacted by the pandemic, you are eligible for these free classes and trainings. You can choose from more than 100 different courses at our four institutions. Most of the courses are available online with flexible scheduling offerings, and all are aligned with the high demand careers such as early childhood education, healthcare, business, and manufacturing. This program also has an added benefit in that it provides funding for support services such as computers, childcare, and transportation. So if you've had your hours reduced, you've been laid off from your job, your job no longer exists, you're self-employed and have, you, have experienced financial losses, or you've been impacted by your daycare closing, this opportunity is for you. To those of you who have been struggling to find your bearings during this pandemic, the good news is that this, free opportunity, this is a free opportunity that can help you gain new skills, change your career, boost your resume, and prepare yourself for the next job. But here's the challenge. The challenge is you need to act quickly. Funding is only available for classes and training this fall, and you need to sign up within the next couple weeks for these courses. So I encourage you to visit www.vsc.edu slash Vermont workers to learn more. And I hope you'll all take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. And now I would like to introduce Deputy Secretary Heather Boucher. Thank you, President Judy. Good morning. Uh, we are still seeing a relatively small number of cases of COVID-19 in our schools. The health department has been very responsive to the needs of districts, and that partnership from both a health and communications perspective is working quite well. I'll begin my update by congratulating Susan Rosado of Colchester High School. Yesterday, we announced that Susan, who teaches English language students at Colchester, was named the 2021 Vermont Teacher of the Year. English language students are often new to the U.S. and need additional supports to be successful in school due to language barriers. Susan's dedication to her students and her community is commendable and certainly worthy of celebration. Dedication and commitment are typical of so many Vermont educators. During our COVID-19 response, we have asked a lot of our teachers and our schools, and their response has been exemplary. 
Susan and her team had to ensure that their students had school reopening materials translated into many different languages and that students were supported in both remote and in-person learning. This was and remains challenging work, but it is also inspiring work. We are so grateful to dedicated teachers like Susan who have stepped up during this emergency to support our students. And directly to Susan, I know that Secretary French was very honored yesterday to recognize your service by naming you the 2021 Vermont Teacher of the Year. On a similar note of gratitude, I also want to mention that this week is National School Lunch Week. I want to thank all of the school food service personnel around Vermont who have worked so hard since March to ensure that our children have access to food both in school and at home. Late last week, the USDA announced it is extending waivers for the school meals program that were due to expire in December. Under these waivers, every Vermont student can receive free school meals. We are pleased these waivers have been extended through the rest of the school year. We are now in the process of working with our local school nutrition staff to support them in implementing these waivers. In addition, last week we closed our first administration of a monthly data collection designed to monitor trends in student instruction modalities, such as in-person and remote. We will collect these data on a monthly basis at the end of the month. Nearly all districts, over 90%, responded to this data collection. We still have some data to clean up from independent schools, but these charts on the screen provide a good summary of the general trends across the state as of the end of September. So overall, as you can see, about 62% of our schools are in a hybrid mode. Um, excuse me, I would, I would collapse the fully remote and the hybrid into some kind of um, hybrid mode, and, and that would be um, closer to uh, 70 to 80%. Um, again, these are data from the end of September when we first announced the shift to step three. So we do anticipate a shift to more in-person instruction the next time we do this collection at the end of October, so later this month. And if we can go to the next slide, so as expected, as you can see here, more elementary schools are utilizing in-person instruction than our middle school and high schools. This conforms with our policy emphasis on prioritizing in-person uh, school experiences for elementary students and the fact that remote learning tends to be more viable for older students. We will report these data on the Agency of Education website going forward and use the data to consider additional guidance for school districts. We will also be updating the map that we developed with the Department of Financial Regulation to show patterns from the initial, the initial school district reopening plans. Finally, one issue that has emerged as a concern from districts in the last week or so is holiday travel. Governor Scott um, noted this as well in his remarks. We're hearing that schools are concerned about the implications of holiday travel on their ability to offer in-person instruction. In an interview this week, Dr. Fauci stated we should not expect Thanksgiving to be a typical holiday this year. He encouraged us to be very careful and prudent about social gatherings, particularly when members of the family might be at risk because of their age or their underlying health conditions. So it's probably important for all of us to carefully review our holiday travel plans in the coming months. To be sure, uh, celebrating holidays are important for our mental and emotional well-being but it's probably uh, important that we also acknowledge the public health implications and factor those into our decision making this year when we can. That concludes my update. I will now turn it over to Dr. Kelso. Thank you. Good morning, as you heard, Dr. Levine is taking a few well-deserved days off, his first, I think, since February. Um, if you've been following our data, you know that we are up to 1,915 total cases in Vermont during this pandemic. And um, many of you will have noticed that we went from several days of just a few cases, new cases each day, to 10 or more cases um, each day in more recent days. Um, it's a bit concerning, but it's not at all um, different than what we've been forecasting. and talking about, we anticipate that as the weather gets colder, as we get into the fall, as schools are open and other things are um, opening up a bit more, we do expect to see more cases. Um, 
As you can see on the slide, I'm, I'm going to talk about an outbreak that we've been investigating this week, um, an outbreak of COVID-19 cases among members of a youth and adult recreational hockey and broomball teams in central Vermont. And the link among the cases came to our attention last week thanks to our contact tracing efforts. The outbreak is associated with people who practiced or played at the Central Vermont Memorial Civic Center in Montpelier earlier this month. And it appears that cases are limited to players and their close contacts. So far, there's no indication of community spread of the virus. As of this morning, we've identified 18 confirmed cases among players and their close contacts. Most of the cases so far have been identified among adults. And the health department has informed schools if any of the youth were in attendance at school while they were infectious. The contact tracing team is continuing their work to identify and reach out to people who may be affected. So please, it's important that you answer the phone if you get a call from the health department. This is how we give you and your family the information you need if you, to know if you're at risk. And it's key to our ability to contain outbreaks and spread in the community. Tomorrow, Saturday, there will be a pop-up test clinic at the Barry Auditorium from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we're recommending that anyone with direct links to the teams, their close contacts, and people associated with the Civic Center be tested. Testing is not recommended for the broader Montpelier community in response to this situation, but the clinic is open to the public. To make an appointment to be tested, go to health vermont.gov slash COVID-19 dash testing. And uh, these, these two slides, if we could go back to the previous one, please, thank you, um, indicates the um, dates of onset of each of the cases associated with this um, outbreak. And we've identified through contact tracing efforts that there were multiple opportunities for potential transmission between the end of September and the very early days of October, resulting in subsequently identifying these cases with some limited transmission to close contacts. But again, uh, no community spread has been identified at this point. In addition to the other cases reported this week, two cases are associated with Union Elementary School in Montpelier. These cases are the first instance in Vermont of transmission within a school. As with all cases, we're working to identify close contacts and have been working closely with the school and district officials to investigate and in their efforts to keep their students, teachers, staff, and the community informed. These cases are not associated with the, the hockey-related outbreak. The fact that this is the state's first in-school transmission doesn't mean an escalation of the virus. It means that someone who is infectious transmitted it to someone, just this time inside a school rather than a workplace or a long-term care facility or other setting. It does mean that despite our low rate of COVID-19 in Vermont, this highly infectious virus is still at a risk to Vermonters and we have to keep up our own personal and institutional efforts to prevent its spread in every way that we can. I want to share our concerns about travel as well, especially with the fall and winter holiday season coming. Unfortunately, the latest travel map from Commissioner Pichek isn't showing many green counties in areas beyond our borders. So this means that if you do decide to leave Vermont, you likely will need to quarantine when you come back. And if you have visitors from out of state, they will need to follow our, our Vermont quarantine rules while they're here. We all want to see our friends and family who live farther away. And because these are people we trust, we may let our guard down more than we usually do. To not worry too much about their county and whether it's green, um, we might sit closer to them, spend more time together, or take our masks off. But the fact is, we don't know and they may not know if they've been exposed to the virus, especially if they live in an area virtually anywhere outside Vermont with a higher prevalence of COVID-19. Tests before they arrive or at the time that they arrive reflect just one moment in time, and it still may take several days 
from the time that they were last exposed for the virus to replicate in their system to the point where a test can detect it. This is why following our prevention guidance and quarantine rules is so important. As we move indoors and as schools are open, we need to make sure we're keeping these social and holiday visits as safe as we can. We're all chafing at the bit. Keeping our guard up for months and months has been hard. But the virus doesn't watch the calendar and we need to continue to take these precautions and work them into our daily lives. I, I also want to mention the role of testing when it comes to travel. Starting this week, you may have seen that rapid antigen testing is available at the Burlington Airport. And we appreciate both the city of Burlington and airport officials being partners in educating travelers and visitors about preventing spread of COVID-19. As we've said, testing is one critical tool to find the virus and prevent its spread. And there are several types of tests, each, each with its own best use. And as Dr. Levine has discussed, antigen testing is different than PCR, which is the gold standard. But antigen testing does have a role and can be useful. In general, we've said antigen tests should not be used to diagnose asymptomatic people, but they can be informative for people who have a known exposure to a confirmed case of COVID-19. If you do travel to Vermont by plane, you still need to quarantine for 14 days. You also have the option to be tested on day seven or later to shorten your quarantine, but it needs to be a negative PCR test. And remember, testing is not prevention. Test results give you a snapshot in time of whether you have the virus. Following state guidance and, and rules will help keep the virus from spreading. And finally, on a lighter note, Halloween. It's getting closer, so I wanted to remind people of what Dr. Levine has said here before. You can still celebrate Halloween safely. Like other places we go these days, we just need to keep three things in mind. First, can you keep a six foot distance from people who aren't in your household? Walking around a neighborhood outside is a good example of that. If you're giving out candy, think of creative ways to keep that safe distance, like having bags of candy ready to grab or set up a candy slide. There are lots of good and sometimes extravagant ideas on the internet. The second, are you and others around you wearing masks? We're all used to getting to wearing them by now, but it's, and it's a great time over Halloween to incorporate them into our costumes. And finally, number three, how crowded is the place you're going? Keep your group small and remember that outside is always safer than inside. If you're trick or treating and one neighborhood seems too busy, skip it and move on to the next one. And as always, if you're sick, please stay home. You can eat the candy you bought, just don't tell our nutrition staff. We all need to find ways to balance the seriousness of the pandemic with some fun. And if Halloween is your kind of fun, you can find safe ways to celebrate. And now I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Kelso. And then we'll now open it up to questions. Calvin. Probably for Dr. Kelso. So, um, regarding the airport testing, um, if after receiving the test, people still have to quarantine for two weeks, I guess what what is the point of having the tests, and is this a waste of money? It's a valid question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, a test can be useful because if you know you do it at the right time on the right day. Um, and you are infected, you can identify that infection with a test. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one point in time, so it doesn't mean that you're not going to become symptomatic the next day. It doesn't mean that um, you're going to remain asymptomatic, but if you were tested the next day, it wouldn't be positive. So um, it's, it's valid if it gives you a positive result that you weren't aware of because then you know that you're um, infectious and, and uh, need to isolate. But if it's negative, it's honestly not that helpful. Um, and regardless, uh, you still need to follow the quarantine rules. So people can make their own decisions about whether or not to access that testing. 
And I had a question about the um, hockey league as well. Um, as you probably saw, uh, New Hampshire has suspended uh, most of their, their uh, hockey leagues. I'm wondering if through the contact tracing uh, process so far, if there has been any link, whether it be through uh, interscholastic or travel teams or anything like that. Any link to New Hampshire? Um, we, we do know that some Vermont hockey players did travel out of state. Uh, we don't know what role that might have played in acquiring the infection or you know, causing further spread. Um, it is one of the things we're looking into further. But I think there are a lot of factors. You know, there's, there's travel um, to non-green areas. There's um, not wearing masks. There's not social distancing. I'm not saying that these things are things that happen. These things are um, potential risk factors that could contribute to spread. So um, we all need to keep in mind all the rules, not just travel, but wearing masks, staying apart, um, not gathering in groups, things like that. And then I guess one last question is for the governor as well. Uh, you may have seen that the governor of Maryland, you wrote in Ronald Reagan on his ballot. I'm wondering if you've made a, uh, a decision on you know, whether you'll vote for uh, Vice President Biden or if you'll be running something else. Yeah, well, as I stated before, um, I will not be voting for President Trump. Uh, I have not made up my mind at this point, um, but I'm rest assured, uh, whoever, if I decide to write in, it will be a living person. David? Thank you. Um, another question following up on how this about the uh, hockey outbreak there. Uh, there had been a, uh, I think a few weeks ago now, a hockey official in Maine, and, and it sounded like there was quite a bit of spread associated to that. Do we know if any of the people who played at the Civic Center or in any of the hockey leagues, uh, being looked at so closely in Vermont right now, had been in contact with anybody in Maine or had been in contact with anybody involved in any known outbreak in other states? I, I think the EPI team is looking into that, uh, obviously. Um, I think it's a good reminder, though, um, and I spoke with Governor Sununu yesterday before they had announced it about what they were going to do. Now, New Hampshire, um, just so that we put this uh, in relative terms to Vermont, uh, they've had 158 cases thus far uh, amongst 23 different teams. So their issue is far greater than ours at this point. Our you know, guidelines are much more stringent uh, than theirs. Uh, we, have, um, we have promoted the, the fact that you should be wearing masks during play. Um, they don't, um, and, um, and they allow spectators as well. So it's much different uh, than here. And they also allow uh, much more interstate play uh, than we do. So we are going to continue to watch uh, what's happening in New Hampshire, learn from them, um, but we need to, uh, to make sure that we're vigilant, that we're following the guidelines, that we aren't uh, becoming more uh, lax in some respects due to all the success we've had here in Vermont. So um, over the next uh, uh, 48 to 72 hours, uh, we're going to make some, uh, some decisions. Uh, and, and some of the decisions may uh, be sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm concerned about with New Hampshire shutting down uh, their facilities, for instance, um, what impact that will have on Vermont, because I'm sure there's going to be border communities and hockey players that are going to want to pick up some uh, ice time in Vermont. Uh, and we want to prevent that from happening. So uh, there may be some guidance issued uh, in the next uh, 24 hours uh, regarding that. Uh, but as well, we'll contemplate other ripple effects of what uh, what that means to us here in the state. Sure. Under consideration for those decisions that you're monitoring right now, would that uh, affect players in the state, the ability to play, venues being open, or would this more be for people coming from out state? Uh, well, a little bit of both. I mean, just naturally with them closing their facilities in New Hampshire, uh, this will impact some uh, in Vermont who have uh, have already scheduled to, to play there. Uh, that won't be happening uh, right now. Uh, but more about, I'm, I'm more concerned about them uh, wanting to come here to, to play or have some ice time and so forth, uh, and uh, maybe coming from, from counties 
uh, that are not green uh, because we're seeing more and more red uh, in New Hampshire. They've had an uptick in the number of positive cases of late, and uh, that's concerning. So uh, we'll be, uh, again, updating some of our guidance and reinforcing uh, the guidance we have right now um, to make sure that anyone who's playing in a uh, men's or women's league uh, and, uh, and or youth leagues are adhering to the guidance that we have in place today. Um, it sounded like uh, earlier in the week there was a huge impact perhaps as uh, uh, the administration considers sports, uh, winter sports moving forward. Um, is that the same situation now or do some of the, uh, the hockey outbreaks and now that's the school spread um, are things changing perhaps more, or is there likelihood for things to change more, more restrictions as the guidance gets ready to come out? Yeah, again, we'll learn from this experience. Um, I, I happen to believe uh, that much of what we're seeing here in Vermont, and this is just me anecdotally uh, seeing the situation from 30,000 feet, but I believe it's more of the social aspects outside of, of the play, uh, not on the rink. Uh, so um, I'm hopeful uh, that'll be the case. Uh, so that we can continue to offer sports in a very measured different way than previous uh, to our, our kids and our adults um, so that we can do, you know, offer this in Vermont uh, for some normalcy, some mental health uh, and, uh, and lifestyle, uh, but doing it in a safe manner. And lastly, um, just to get a sense of uh, how the decision-making process works when uh, considering to either close the school or switch it to remote learning. I know certainly the trend continues towards in-person, um, but specifically the relationship between the health department and the schools themselves. Do schools have the final say on whether they say open or not, or how does that relationship sort of play out? I'll let either Dr. Kelso or, or Dr. Boucher, uh, or Secretary Boucher answer that. It's doctor as well, isn't it? Um, but. Um, but from my standpoint, I believe it's a local decision, um, but I'll let them answer that. Thank you. Yeah, the EPI teams, whether it's the contact tracing team, the outbreak prevention and response team, uh, they work closely with the school officials to um, determine what the situation is, whether there's been spread, how many students and staff are impacted, um, and whether the school has the capacity to stay open if, you know, if staff are out. Um, or whether the recommendation from the health department is to close a pod or a classroom or a certain part of the school. So the recommendation comes from the health department um, and then the schools do with that what they feel is appropriate given their particular circumstances. Um, I suppose it's theoretically possible that the health department could recommend closing a classroom, for example, and the school pushing back and not wanting to do that. Um, we have not encountered that yet, but, um, and I don't anticipate that we'd encounter that, but, uh, so it's a health recommendation, and then the school does with that uh, what it chooses. And when identifying something like a, a cluster or an outbreak at a school, is that something the school notifies you about, or do you watch the numbers and then let the school know? Mm -hmm. You might want to keep on this. Um, it can happen both ways. Um, sometimes we hear about situations from schools because a school nurse, for example, might have a sick child um, and then they talk to the health department. Or um, uh, sometimes we get lab results, we investigate the cases. In, in that case investigation, we determine whether it's a school-aged child or an adult who works in a school and whether they were in the school while they were infectious and then uh, we share information with the school as needed to make decisions. Thank you very much. Steve. Uh, Dr. Kelso, since you're up there, <laughs> and um, actually for you, maybe too, Governor, are you concerned, or is the health department concerned, or the administration even, with the, um, the advent of these retail, if you will, uh, testing sites coming in, uh, i.e. Burlington, that the business becomes lucrative enough that it you know, the, you'll get the advertising, they'll start, people will get the wrong idea behind uh, what a test will uh, incur, or a false sense of security, I guess. I do worry about the false sense of security. Um, we did work with the, the entity doing testing at the airport um, on what guidance and information they're sharing with people who get a test. 
Um, I haven't seen it, but I understand that it does indicate that people are still required to quarantine regardless of the result. Um, so that, I think, is the most important part. I think, um, you know, it's not a bad thing to give people access to more information if they're seeking it. And uh, a positive test among an asymptomatic traveler can be really useful information. At the same time, a negative test isn't that helpful. Um, so again, people can make their own decisions. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing that uh, these uh, entities are offering testing as long as people understand what the result means for them and what they still need to do. Steve, I just want to reinforce uh, what uh, Dr. Kelso and Dr. Levine have been saying all along. You know, this testing is just a snapshot in time. It's not a prevention uh, measure. Uh, but it is good information. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about um, more surveillance testing, uh, sentinel testing, and so forth, which is helpful uh, to provide us with information about the spread and uh, the amount of infection coming into the state. But if, if someone is having a test after traveling, immediately getting off an aircraft um, that may come up negative, uh, they, they, they could have picked something up in their terminal uh, on, the, on the travel uh, just hours before, and it won't show up. So. Um, that's the concern. Uh, I share that with, uh, with Dr. Kelso, that it gives people a false sense of security. Um, they need to, uh, you know, abide by the guidelines, and they need to, uh, to quarantine uh, for that 14-day period or seven days uh, with a PCR test. And uh, finally, if, uh, have you had any communication with our uh, congressional delegation uh, in response to the both sides sort of falling apart as, uh, as we uh, look at relief for the, uh, for the states in COVID, uh, getting some money out here to people. Uh, both sides say, uh, you know, we, we've got a great package and, uh, you know, it's the other guy that's doing the pro is having the problem. Um, have you gotten any message out to, uh, to folks and is there any sort of uh, sense of optimism at all? Um, I, uh, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing in Washington. That's the way Washington seems to work. Um, it's really unfortunate because uh, the American people are the ones who are suffering at this point. And it's uh, a lot of it's due to politics and posturing and so forth before the election. Uh, my hope is that uh, after maybe a couple weeks uh, when, the, uh, when the election is over, uh, that they can all get serious about uh, providing for Americans, and, and Vermont is in need as well. So I'm in, I believe there will be some sort of package. Everyone has talked about having some sort of package, stimulus package of some sort available. Um, the size, the magnitude will be determined. But I am, uh, I'm not hopeful that will be uh, before the election. It will be some time after. Okay, moving to the phones now. Kat, WCAX. Hi, these questions are likely for Dr. Kelso. Some communities are advising residents against trick-or-treating. I know Montpelier yesterday said it's discouraging people from doing it. Should cities and towns be discouraging it? Uh, I'll let Dr. Kelso answer uh, some of that. She uh, had remarked in, in, uh, in, in some of her uh, her statement about how to do it effectively and, and safely. And I think that's the bottom line. Uh, communities have to make up their own minds, uh, but uh, individuals do as well. If, you, uh, if everyone adheres to the guidelines, stays six feet apart, uh, uses their imagination about how to distribute uh, some of the candy and so forth uh, on these visits, uh, everybody will be okay, especially because it's outside. Uh, but communities uh, have a responsibility uh, for their constituents as well, uh, and uh, it's up to, uh, to them, uh, those constituents, to, to abide by that. Uh, but from our standpoint, we're trying to just at least provide the guidance on how to do it safely, and I think that Dr. Kelso uh, did a great job in, in providing that. And, uh, uh, Kat, I don't think uh, Dr. Kelso has anything to add to that. Did you have another question? Uh, I did, and this one was a contact tracing question. Um, I had a viewer who wanted to know what happens if someone in a person's household tests positive for the virus, and then the person who's the housemate, you know, schedules a test. Does the person who's still waiting for their test results have to tell their work 
And then does their work have to notify the other employees that one of their employees had a member of a household who tested positive? Basically, how far out does the obligation to notify about potential contacts go? Because I imagine it's not wanting to panic people, but also wanting to make sure that you limit contact. Yeah, a lot of personal responsibility there, but I'll let Dr. Kelso answer. Kat, if I understood the scenario, um, you're talking about um, someone in a household testing positive and their um, partner or household contact um, being a close contact because they share a household. Um, and so it's appropriate for that household contact to get a test um, you know, s s at some point during uh, s at least several days after their initial exposure to give the virus time to be detectable. Um, and to uh, quarantine for 14 days after their last contact with the person in their house who's positive, or at least seven days with a negative test. Um, that person, the household contact of the confirmed case, um, does need to quarantine and therefore should not be going to work. So uh, what they tell their employer is entirely up to them. Uh, but they should not be at work. Um, their, their coworkers, however, um, are considered contacts of contacts. Um, they're contacts to the, the person in the household who's a contact to the confirmed case. So there's no concern for the workers unless the, the household person also tests positive and was at the workplace while they were infectious. Um, so, you know, the, there's a cascade of information that we need to collect about uh, a case, who their contacts are, uh, the time frame that the contact um, was potentially exposed, and then, uh, you know, what that means for other people around them. So uh, there's a lot of information gathering, and um, some of that information is important to share, like, if you're a quarantine person, you shouldn't be at work or school. Um, but for contacts of contacts, um, there's no concern. And uh, I can see how the people in the workplace, for example, might be nervous because they've heard about their coworkers' infected household case. Um, and they might be concerned, why haven't I heard from the health department? Don't I need to be contacted? The, the um, message there is, if, if you're identified as a potential contact of a case, um, the health department will reach you. Um, if you don't hear from the health department, you probably have absolutely nothing to worry about. And if the situation changes, you will hear from the health department. Does that help? I think it does, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Lisa Rathke, BAP. Hi, thanks. Um, I had a question about the Montpelier school cases. Um, can you tell us if those are in students or teachers or both, those two cases? Dr. Kelso. Actually, I am not able to tell you that um, due to the um, safe harbor provision in HIPAA. Um, so unfortunately, I just can't share any additional information. We're posting information on the health department website on the, um, any cases who were at school while they were infectious, whether it's adults or children. And we're not breaking them out by how many adults and how many children. We're just giving the total number. We're updating that once a week, and it's on the health department website. OK. I see. And then back to the hockey outbreak. Um, <clears throat> I see just New Hampshire's pod hockey now for two weeks in indoor rinks. I mean, is that, is that a step that Vermont might consider taking? Um, Lisa, as I said before, you know, the, there's a difference between New Hampshire and Vermont in many different ways. You know, 158 cases uh, they've had as a result of uh, some uh, amongst 23 different teams uh, amongst the hockey players in um, in uh, Hampshire. Um, they don't require masks during play. Um, they allow spectators. Uh, they have more interstate play. So the, 
their circumstances are much different than ours. Uh, I, I would say we are, we'll consider uh, anything to keep Vermonters safe, but at this point in time, we want to make sure that they're adhering to the guidelines that we put into place now. We're asking uh, players uh, to wear masks during play. And if you can't do that when you're, when you're playing, um, if it's just that uncomfortable, don't play. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Just don't play. Okay. Thank you very much. Liam Elder Connors, VPR. Liam, VPR, star six on mute. Hi, um, I had a question uh, to start off with um, Dr. Telso about contact tracing. Uh, I just was wondering, you mentioned that the current increase in cases still needs, uh, you still feel like you have capacity to do adequate contact tracing. Um, how many tracers do you currently have and sort of are you planning to ramp that up as you expect more cases to, uh, to ramp up as well? Yeah, Liam, we've been um, tracking that and following it and thinking about it since February or March. <laughs> um, we have, I think, over 100, slightly over 100 contact tracers who we could pull in at a moment's notice if we needed to. Um, we typically use, um, I think, about 10 or 15 any given day, maybe fewer than that. Um, so we certainly have um, plenty of capacity now. Our contact tracing record as far as the number of people we reach within 24 and 48 hours is um, among the best, if not the best, in the country. And, um, you know, we have reserve staff who are trained up and ready to go if we need to pull them in. So um, I, think, I think for right now, um, we're feeling very comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, if you were to have to activate, you know, all, I guess like all 100, I mean, what, you know, what, what, how, how much could you be tracing? I guess what's the outer limit right now? Yeah, it depends because um, some cases have just one household contact. Um, and, you know, that's a relatively quick interview. Um, we reach the person, we give them the information, get what we need, um, and then that situation is wrapped up and that person is um, quarantining at home and there's no risk for further spread and it's pretty straightforward. Um, other cases um, might have been at work and um, doing other things during their infectious period. And so we might identify 10 or more close contacts for that person. And so then we need multiple contact tracers to divide up those people and make the phone calls and do the interviews and collect the information. So um, it, it just sort of depends. I think the most, um, I could get you a, a precise number, but I think the most uh, contact tracing staff we've used, you know, on any one day is, is well under 50. It's well short of the capacity that we have. Okay. Um, and, and Governor, I, I was wondering from you, um, you know, at the top of this press conference, you sort of laid out a pretty strong message um, to people in the state to kind of keep following guidelines, and especially in light of, you know, we've seen this hockey outbreak, we're seeing kind of, you know, higher numbers than we've been seeing for a while, and we're going to be more indoor, and, you know, there's just all these sort of factors at play, and I, I'm wondering, are, are you confident that, you know, going forward over the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to uh, continue to operate at the same level of openness, or are you expecting to have to institute some more uh, restrictions like we had back in March? Yeah, uh, no, I don't think we'll ever uh, go back to what we had in March. We've learned a lot over the last uh, seven months. Uh, we can be more strategic, uh, more surgical in some respects about if we have to backtrack. Uh, but at this point in time, again, it's up to each and every one of us. If we adhere to the guidance, guidelines in place, if we follow the, the travel policy, uh, if we keep six feet apart, if we wear masks uh, whenever we're in contact with others, we'll be okay. Uh, we'll get through this. Uh, and it's just a, a very slight uptick. Again, when you think about where Vermont is, and, and um, Dr. Kelso didn't, uh, didn't mention that we were 
we're recognized uh, with the EPI team. Um, we're recognized as being one of the leaders in the country in terms of capacity. Uh, throughout from the beginning, uh, we prepared for this, prepared for the worst, um, and we've actually used other agencies uh, to, to try and use uh, that cross-agency support and training and so forth so we could ramp up if necessary. When you look at um, like Wyoming, for instance, Wyoming is now the third lowest, uh, they were the lowest in terms of positivity and the number of cases and so forth. Now they're, they're the third lowest right now. We're, we're the lowest. But they had, um, over the last week, they've had 200 cases a day. Uh, and we've seen the uptick in other states as well. We haven't seen that dramatic of an increase. We expected to have some increase, especially with more travel, schools opening back up, things getting much more back to normal. Um, but, but again, it's just a reminder to us when we see these outbreaks that we just have to be careful. We have to be cautious. We have to take some self-responsibility self uh, because we're in control of this individually uh, and we just can't take this lightly. Uh, we're impacting other people's lives. Um, so just adhere to the guidelines and we'll be okay. Do, do you think that just if everyone follows everything we have in place, we're not gonna we're not gonna be having a, another stay home order this this no. winter? Do you think that'll be I, adequate? Right. I I don't believe that we will. I think that uh, I think Vermonters have learned. Uh, they may be getting a little lax at this point in some areas. Uh, some some are doing everything right, uh, but we you know they're getting complacent um, and understandably. Uh, but uh, and they're getting tired of this. It's almost like battle fatigue in some respects. Uh, but. I believe uh, that they can get back uh, into shape, so to speak, and uh, and get back to doing the right things, and we'll we'll avoid what we're seeing across the country. I have a lot of faith in Vermonters. Thank you, Andrew McGregor, the Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you. Um, this is for Dr. Kelso, or perhaps Secretary Smith. Um, Looking for an update on the facility-wide testing at the skilled nursing facility here in Caledonia County where an employee tested uh, positive earlier this week. I think I'll refer to Secretary Smith on this. I don't... Um, I'm not sure I have a, a, an update on that um, particular incident in terms of what is going on there. I'll um, turn to Dr. Kelso if she, she does. But as you know, we have instituted monthly testing in our long-term care facilities. We're going to see instances of uh, positive tests given the rigorous testing that we're doing in our long-term care facilities. We'll also ramp up our uh, testing if we do find a positive case in a long-term care facility in addition to, um, uh, to a sequence of testing, facility-wide testing, if we do find one. In terms of uh, Caledonia County, I think that was one case in a long-term care facility of a staff person. Uh, and we are uh, moving forward uh, in making sure that person is quarantined, and I think we are moving forward in facility-wide testing. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was curious about. Is, is my understanding was the facility-wide testing would be, uh, I think, performed on uh, Wednesday with results on. Thursday, and then the second round would be done on Sunday. So I guess I'm curious if the results are back. Results are back. The, results are back, and they're all negative except for the index case. Except for the index case. Um, and so, besides the second round that's scheduled for this weekend, any other steps at this point, or is it? Uh, well, there'll be a next round of facility-wide testing on 10:18. Uh, with the expected results at the lab at 1019, and then uh, additional testing will be assessed at that time. But I just want to say, I mean, this facility had good adherence to PPE within the facility. And um, so the, the other uh, circumstance that the, the employee worked both at the nursing facility and at the hospital, there's, there's no um, ongoing um, 
exposure concern um, regarding their time at the hospital. We're looking at that right now in terms of contact tracing. Um, there was good uh, adherence to social distancing and PPE at the hospital, and uh, the facility is providing a list to us of, um, of several employees to contact um, uh, just to make sure that we do, the EPI team does uh, contact trace them. Um, and if I may, uh, uh, Dr. Kelso, regarding the hockey um, outbreak, uh, can you say how many different adult teams and youth teams were involved? Was it one of each or, or multiple? And is there a connection between the adult and youth teams um, other than just the facility? Is, is like, for instance, an adult player happens to be the youth coach or, or something like that? Yeah, there are some connections. Um, my understanding is there are two different youth teams and at least two adult teams. Um, that's my understanding based on what I'm recalling in this moment, so it could be a little bit off. Um, there are connections among some of the adults and some of the youth, um, but the bottom line is we haven't identified the precise you know, source or origin or um, you know, who who was the first case. Uh, we haven't been able to pin that down. We often can't pin that down in a, a situation or an outbreak. Um, sometimes we're able to sort it out as we do more interviews and gather more information. Sometimes we just can't. Um, so we'll have to see what we're able to sort out with this situation. Um, there are some relationships between adults and youth, um, but we're not quite sure what direction the spread um, went in each of those cases. And um, do you uh, agree with the governor's perception that uh, this may be more related to off-ice interaction um, as opposed to uh, uh, on-ice gameplay, things like that? Yeah, I think there are lots of factors. You know, we know what works in preventing spread, staying apart, um, not being around people when you're sick, wearing masks, all of those things. Um, I think there are probably a number of factors that went into spread in this outbreak, um, including activities off the ice, very likely. Um, so I, I don't, I agree with the governor. We have not been able to say that, you know, transmission is largely due to playing hockey. Um, it, it may be more due to activities that surround the playing of hockey. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Brad, we have it further. Can, can I just go oh, back to sorry. Andrew for yeah. just just a minute, Andrew? Um, just so as a reminder again to everyone, uh, many of these rinks have been open throughout the summer. Uh, many of these teams have been playing throughout the summer. Some of the youth leagues have been playing throughout the summer. So we haven't experienced this uh, at this point. It may be ramped up again. Uh, we may be getting more lax. There may be some more social gatherings, uh, maybe outside of the rink and so forth. That's what we're looking at uh, at this point. But we'll learn a lot from New Hampshire. I mean, they're, they're trying to get to the bottom of it as well, and maybe there'll be something that connects uh, uh, on ice versus uh, anything else, but, but we don't know that at this point. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, ER doctor at Northwest that tested positive. It's my understanding that she had a connection somehow to the uh, either the outbreak of South Burlington High School or the uh, hockey uh, outbreak or maybe even a combination. Um, I'm wondering how many people have been contact traced in connection with the ER doctor and if any of those have come back positive. Um, I'll start with uh, Secretary Smith and then Go to Dr. Kelso. Thank you, uh, Greg. Um, let me let me start by saying something that Dr. Kelso may have said, or something that I at least heard uh, today during a, a morning briefing. Um, these um, this hockey outbreak has has impacted schools, uh, several schools, 
and um, in several classrooms. And I, I want to really be um, careful when I talk about schools because in most cases, when the contact tracing team goes out, they talk about classrooms, not entire schools and, and various things. So talking about classrooms, what do we do with classrooms, who needs to quarantine, who doesn't need the quarantine. Um, this hockey outbreak has affected several classrooms and it has affected um, uh, healthcare uh, facilities as well. Um, we'll have a press release about um, uh, about the, the, the hospital is doing a press release about the, the situation that they have at Northwest Medical Center. Uh, Northwest Medical Center uh, didn't identify any high-risk contacts. Some staff, they are testing there uh, out of an abundance of precaution. I, I do not know the, the answer to that question. Great. <clears throat> Any follow-ups, Greg? Uh, yeah, just a quick follow-up. I didn't know if Dr. Kelso had anything to say, but... Uh, no. I think, Governor, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit this morning. Uh, with area ice rinks being kind of a discussion with this, uh, a lot of rinks are putting in their ice right now. It's a costly thing to do, and not just put it in, but also to maintain it. Do you expect to allow high school hockey uh, this winter, or is it too soon to say? I, I just, I, I'm hearing people wondering if the money to put in the ice not knowing is, is really a wise investment. Yeah, I um, understand their concern as well. Um, we'll be updating that winter guidance, I would say, uh, in the next week, uh, sometime next week, so they should have their answer. But uh, again, we'll learn a little bit from what's going on right now uh, in terms of New Hampshire and so forth. Uh, but my hope is that we can move forward. Uh, as long as we adhere to very strict guidelines and have have uh, safety uh, be the um, being being the primary concern, uh, so I'm hopeful that we can continue to move forward as we expected. Uh, but we'll we'll know more after the next uh, few days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Governor. Thank you, Secretary Smith, for your explanation. Thanks, Rick. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, these are most likely for Dr. Kelso. Uh, the Barry City Elementary and Middle School announced yesterday that somebody there had tested positive for the virus. Is that related to the hockey and stuff at the Montpelier rink? I'm just checking my notes because um, we're following a number of different situations and I don't want to confuse them. So bear with me for a second. Um, the Barry City School, you said? Barry City Elementary Middle School, yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so just reading my notes to um, distill what I'm allowed to say. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm allowed to, <laughs> I'm actually not sure I'm allowed to answer that question. Um, I had a slide up earlier um, where I indicated that associated with the hockey outbreak, there are about 10 different facilities that here we go. Um, workplaces and schools where someone somehow associated with the hockey outbreak was at either a workplace or a school while they were potentially infectious. So we have one college, we have three different K through 12 schools and five different workplaces. With the exception of one workplace, it's only one hockey associated case in each of those settings. So we're not talking about, you know, 
dramatic potential for spread or anything. Um, but I'm not sure that I should answer questions specifically about any, any of those settings and you know, naming them. Uh, Montpelier had asked for everyone at the elementary school to be tested after the two people there tested positive. But the Department of Health said that's not recommended at this time. Why is that? Yeah. Um, um, we, so our normal response is we um, learn of cases, um, interview them, find out when their infectious period was based on the date their symptoms started, and then identify who they were around while they were infectious. Um, so that takes some investigating. Um, we can't always assume that just because there's a case in a teacher, for example, that a classroom or other coworkers were exposed, because it might be that that teacher wasn't even at school during their infectious period. So first we, we do that um, investigating, and then um, based on what we learn and based on the types of contacts that we identify and which precautions are in place, you know, is everybody masked all the time? Um, are people six feet apart? How much time do they spend together in a particular room? Are they um, in pods that are shifting throughout the school during the day? Or are they, are they one pod that's sitting in the same classroom for the whole school day? Questions like that. And then based on that, we determine whether um, we are recommending quarantine or quarantine plus testing um, for those contacts. And so it's very situationally dependent, and it depends on um, the expert advice of the contact tracers. So does any of that calculus change, given that this, is, this the school this is the first time where there's been in-school transmission of the virus? No. Um, you know, again, it's the same. It's the same investigation. Um, we know that this virus spreads from one person to another, whether it's in a school or a workplace, or uh, you know, another setting. We've seen that throughout the past several months. So, this is what this virus does. It's relatively easy to spread from one person to another, and um, just because it happened to be in a school doesn't change how we're approaching the opening of school or the practices that are in place in schools. Okay, thank you. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Hello, thanks for taking my call. Um, my question is about visitors to Vermont. Despite the shrinking travel map and the number of visitors who can now come to Vermont without quarantine, we're seeing no reduction in the number of visitors to Vermont including those from states that are beyond a single day of travel and those whose states have no green counties whatsoever. This was readily apparent over last weekend, long weekend. A community member had asked if it would be possible to have Commissioner Pichek resurrect the mobility data slide for the Northeast that we were shown earlier this spring and summer to compare it to the current travel map next Tuesday. Yeah, I, that is uh, possible. We actually talked about that. I, I spoke with Commissioner Pichek this morning about showing the mobili mobility data um, on Tuesday um, to, as in comparison to last year and so forth. So yes, he's, um, he'd be able to do that, I believe. Great. Thank you very much. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Um, I had a question about the, the last wages program, maybe weigh in on it. I was wondering if uh, the, the $900 federal program has, has now played out and what has uh, come with the, the state, the sort of associated state $100 uh, program that, that you had talked about previously. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Harrington, are you still on? I am, sir. Uh, so with regards to the lost wage assistance program, um, the second round uh, was announced. We did receive the funding. Uh, I think it was just about uh, two weeks ago that we actually received the funding for the second uh, round of payments. And so um, we'll actually have a bulk uh, payment going out at the start of next week to the tune of about, I believe, $25 million um, to a, a number of different um, claimants. And let me see if I have that number right here. 
So it'll be roughly $25.2 million to about 34,500 claimants uh, the first part of next week. We were doing some data validation on the certification piece. Um, and uh, once we have that squared away, those payments will be issued for lost wage assistance. That would complete the, the full six weeks of benefits we receive from the federal government. Um, we'll continue to issue benefits um, out of that program for anybody who either comes through the door or is processed through the system uh, after the fact uh, until that program either ends under the federal terms of the program or uh, funding um, runs out. With regard to the $100 benefit that was passed uh, through the legislature, um, that actually didn't, uh, it started or went into effect on September 27th. However, um, we always look at week ending. So the, the week ending October 3rd would have been the first week. We will likely, um, just because of timing with LWA and the need to validate claims um, to be able to issue those funds, um, the four weeks of that program, so the $400 or some variation thereof, um, will go to eligible claimants at the end of October in one uh, bulk payment. Um, and that could be that they're eligible for anywhere from one week to all four weeks. Okay, great. So the other thing I saw on the DSF, this is, this is probably not your purview, but uh, they were talking about the economic impact payments um, still, there are still Vermonters who have received those, apparently. I was wondering how many uh, people, they're still eligible, eligible to get them until November 21st, but I was wondering how many Vermonters are still waiting for those $1,200 checks, which, you know, started way back in April or something like that, the federal government. Yeah, that, um, I'm, I'm not sure who would have the answer to that, uh, to be honest with you, Tim. If that's the twelve hundred dollars that the fed, federal government uh, issued. Yeah, so they some of them were direct deposited, some of them wound up being uh, debit cards and that sort of thing, and, and not everybody got them. And, uh, I just saw a notice actually on the on the Quantico's website homepage uh, about uh, people could still apply to get those if they had to receive. Um, I might. I don't know if uh, Secretary Curley or maybe uh, Commissioner Goldstein might be on. I don't know if you have any more information on that. We can we can look into it. I just don't know where where that information would be held, Tim. Okay. Yeah, I don't right. I don't I, have anything to add. I'm happy to look at you know look offline and get back to you. Right. Okay, if it, if it if it turns up then let me know. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. Um, good morning. Um, I have a question that I believe is for Secretary Smith. Um, a, re a reader wrote to us and asked about why the Department of Corrections uh, uses garbage bags as personal protective equipment. And the question really is, is this the best the state can manage? Can't imagine where that might lead us. Mr. Smith. Yeah, they have been experimenting with masks and uh, various uh, protective. Uh, first of all, let me back up, Joe. Uh, first of all, uh, they have all the protective uh, equipment that they need. Um, we've made sure that Corrections has the protective uh, PPE that they need, the protective equipment that they need. Um, one of the things that they have been doing is experimenting with various, uh, various aspects of uh, PPE. They have been doing their own masks. Um, they have been experimenting with uh, some of this, um, what I would call uh, plastic material uh, in order to uh, look at various options in case we have another surge. Um, and PPE becomes an issue. I think it's prudent planning. I think it should be continued. Uh, but at the same time, I just want to assure you and your reader that we have sufficient PPE uh, in, in the state to handle uh, correctional officers. Oh, so 
the idea, if I understand this, is experimenting with possibilities. Um, experimenting with possibilities, and I think when there was a chance that there was going to be a shortage way back when in the beginning, probably looking at how we could use uh, various uh, uh, unique opportunities, I will say. But I, I think the aspect is called unique opportunities. It's, it's not a, um, it, is, it, it is something that we will turn to the regular PPE uh, when, when it's available. Okay, thank you. I, I had also a question for Commissioner Harrington, um, and this one concerns uh, the um, the state's ability to get extended federal unemployment benefits. I see that the uh, the day for the monthly jobless report for Vermont is coming up. I know that there's been some conversation with the federal government about uh, other ways of looking at the real rate of unemployment in the state, and I'm wondering whether there's been any progress made there. Um, maybe I can start with that and then uh, let Commissioner Harrington finish that up, but we have reached out to our congressional delegation. Um, as a result, uh, I believe that there are other states in the same position Vermont is at this point, and we've uh, we've asked the Department of Labor uh, to reflect on that, the unique nature of the pandemic versus what is normal, uh, because these aren't normal times, and Vermonters are in need, and I'm very concerned uh, about the impact that this will have on unemployed Vermonters. Mr. Harrington? Uh, you're absolutely correct, Governor. The only thing that I would add is, um, you know, we have, uh, as the Governor said, the our congressional delegation did write a formal letter and impress upon uh, Secretary Scalia with the U.S. Department of Labor to look at the um, the calculation that is used. Um, I don't have uh, you know the uh, an early look at the numbers that are coming out. Certainly, uh, a major concern for us is if and when we will trigger off of. Um, the, the regular extended benefits program, we triggered off of high extended benefits and that um, cut seven weeks off of the benefit period. Um, and then if when we trigger off of the regular extended benefits program, that will reduce uh, the benefit period by another 13 weeks. So we have not heard uh, anything uh, from the U.S. Department of Labor at this time. So we'll continue to monitor that situation. Um, but we are also um, increasing the level of communication that is going out to individuals who, um, one, were at uh, the end uh, of the extended benefit period when high extended benefits ended, and we'll be doing the same uh, if we have an indication that we'll be rolling off of the regular extended benefits as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, we'll be reaching out as well to the uh, National Governors Association to see if uh, we can get that put on a uh, ongoing list of concerns from the states. Okay. Uh, thank you again. Avery Powell, WCAX. I have two questions for Dr. Kelso. Um, the first is we received a tip that there could be cases within child care facilities in Vermont. The tip, unfortunately, does not specify where, but want to ask if the health department is investigating any um, COVID-19 cases in child care facilities. Not to my knowledge, as of, um, you know, late yesterday, but um, we get lab reports or health care provider reports in all the time, so there may be something that has come in recently. To my knowledge, I'm not aware of any currently. Okay. Um, my second question is just about the new study that came out from the World Health Organization about remdesivir, um, saying it has little to no effect on mortality for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. I was wondering if Vermont has kind of um, looked over their use of it and is um, reviewing how it will be used in the future. Um, I am not Dr. Levine. Um, I, I can say that we, the health department issued a health advisory for clinical providers several months ago on remdesivir and how 
to acquire it if needed for their patients and how to use it. Um, I believe the FDA, I think it is, has recently updated the recommendations for use. Um, Dr. Levine could explain this better. Um, and so we are actively revising our, our health advisory, our HAN, on remdesivir to make sure providers have the newest information. So that, um, I would say, would probably come out next week. But beyond that, I can't get into any specifics because I don't know them. Okay, we can definitely follow up with Dr. Levine. Thank you. Greg Sikenek. Uh, hello. Um, um, am I am I coming here? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions with regards to um, climate change and energy policy. Um, first question is where we are in the process of kickstarting the state's responsibilities under the Global Warming Solutions Act. There are deadlines uh, in the next couple months, for example, about appointing the Climate Council. So I'm wondering if you could talk about what progress you can report on where we are and initiatives going forward to meet its, uh, to meet its requirements. Yeah, very aggressive uh, timeline in terms of uh, appointing the, the 23 members and, and uh, so forth. But um, maybe Secretary Young, if she is on, she might be able to provide more detail as she is chair of that, uh, that council. Secretary Young, are you on? Secretary Moore is on. I'm not seeing Secretary Young. Um, uh, Governor, this is Secretary Moore. I might be able to help answer that question. Great, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Sure. Uh, it's a, so eight of the 23 appointments are actually cabinet members, and those are fairly straightforward. Um, the remaining six appointments um, are the, the Speaker of the House and the Committee on Committees on behalf of the Senate. Um, my understanding, having reached out to, to members of both, um, is that they are actively in the process of reviewing uh, nominations but haven't provided a timeline. The Global Warming Solutions Act gives them 60 days to complete that work. Um, so that gives them pretty well through the end of November. And then we have 30 days to convene our first meeting. Um, we've started some conversations and planning work internally, both on the, the inventory work that will be foundational the work of the Climate Council, as well as just thinking about how to structure and manage these committee meetings. As the, the governor noted, the timeline is very aggressive, with a draft report needing to be complete by October um, of next year uh, so that it can be finalized by December. You, you broke up just in one place there, Secretary Moore. I just want to make sure um, that uh, Greg understands the eight, there's eight members um, that are cabinet positions, and then there's 15. Yeah, there are 15 others uh, that are appointed by the legislature, and they have uh, yet to forward those names at this point. Okay. Um, uh, what might be sort of an associated note, this is the second question. Uh, Governor, two days ago you announced you had signed a letter with four other New England governors with regards to reforming the energy grid operated by ISO New England. I wonder if you could go into a little more detail about how you became involved in that effort and to what extent you see that as part of the state's climate change policy. Well, again, uh, you know, we're very concerned about having uh, an electrical system that can handle uh, all the new initiatives and in renewable energy and so forth uh, are, that we're uh, contemplating. Um, so this uh, not only affects us in Vermont, but all over New England. Uh, we all, all the governors uh, agree uh, that we just need to have a, a very safe and reliable system. And again, because if we go to, uh, if, if we, uh, which we will, uh, go to uh, carbon neutral type of uh, uh, heating and so forth um, and more uh, EVs, then it's just going to put that much more stress and demand on the electrical system that we have in place. So we have to uh, really ramp up uh, in many respects because uh, it'll be significant, uh, the amount of power that we'll have to be uh, utilized throughout the uh, the electrical infrastructure that we have in place right now, so it's a it's a great concern. Okay, um, how long is that? Is this this conversation has been going on for for months, or was this this was this recent? Can you sort of characterize a little bit? Um, I would say uh, uh, you know it came it came together uh, in the last uh, month or so, but 
we've had uh, over the last three or four years, we've had uh, meetings with the ISO and uh, and trying to uh, make sure that we have a, a safe, reliable infrastructure that is uh, in a, in an affordable uh, infrastructure uh, as well. So. Um, these have been ongoing efforts for quite some time, but certainly uh, ramped up significantly uh, due to what we expect will be much more demand for electrical um, vehicles, electrical uh, power, uh, and electrical um, heating as well in the, in the coming years. Okay. Um, one, one last follow-up. You did mention you talked to Governor Sununu uh, yesterday. He did not sign the letter. Um, did this come up in your discussion, and have you lobbied him as a fellow New England Republican governor to uh, to take part in this initiative? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, we didn't speak about that in uh, in particular. Um, I uh, it was just about the the hockey and the pandemic right. and so forth. Understood. Okay. Um, I yield the rest of my time to Mike Donahue. Thank you. Thanks, Mike Donahue. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Dr. Kelso, uh, I guess I'm not sure uh, we heard your answer about the upbroken hockey player and the connection with the ER doctor at Northwest Medical. The word here, I live in South Burlington, is that at least two others have also tested positive or connected with that case and that the hockey player may have gone to Maine. Has your investigation actually gone to Maine? I know you've talked about New Hampshire, but how far is this hockey thing to extend? So we're aware of travel um, to other states. We're aware of, um, as I showed on the slide, a number of schools, a college, and some workplaces that have had a case, or in one case, two cases, associated with the hockey. Um, you know, the situation could continue to evolve. Um, we may see additional spread among close contacts of the cases that we've already identified. Um, I don't anticipate that we'll see broader spread in the community, but you know it's not unheard of that once you have a case, you can sometimes have one or two additional rounds of infection. Um, we've been pretty good in Vermont so far of containing that um, to avoid big outbreaks that continue to spread on and on. But um, you know we'll have to see. Does that answer your question? Uh, a little bit, uh, I guess. but and I guess the other thing you said is there is going to be some sort of press release out of the hospital in St. Albans dealing uh, with the doctor and how she's uh, how she dealing with it and how the hospital is dealing with it. Um, um, the hospital may have done a press release or may be planning to do one. The health department is not planning to do that. We typically wouldn't. Um, give a press release about a, a specific individual case. Okay. Uh, and at one point, I think it was in regards to Montpelier, you threw out HIPAA again. Uh, uh, South Burlington basically has identified their cases as to other schools, as you've heard, have identified schools. HIPAA's been blown out of the water at these news conferences and offline. HIPAA does not apply. I'm just wondering, uh, we've asked for proof, by the way, uh, you may not have been on, but we've asked for proof that HIPAA applies, it's never been forthcoming from the health department of the state. So just wondering what's changed since Dr. Levine went on vacation, uh, why are we back to picking and choosing uh, with what information we're, you guys are giving out? Uh, yeah, to, to be clear, to my knowledge, there has not been a change, and my understanding is that um, from our legal counsel at the department that uh, we are not allowed to release names or um, details about certain situations. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with our... No, no, one, no, one, no one has ever asked for names. It's statistics. And yep. statistics are not but under HIPAA and there's legal journals and there's everything. There's been a bunch of stories written that it just doesn't apply to you guys. Yeah, sometimes names are names of individuals. Sometimes names are names of workplaces or institutions like schools. Um, and um, again, my understanding is we're not releasing those. But, but you have 
given for towns and everything like that. Some towns in Vermont have uh, less people than uh, some schools do in some bigger towns. So uh, it's been an issue of pick and choose by the state here uh, on what they give out. And it's just I, one of the criticisms we continuously hear is there's not an even playing field here that information is not always forthcoming. Mike, this is Mike Smith. Um, we don't pick and choose. We try, and HIPAA isn't thrown out the door on patient confidentiality. I don't know where you're getting your information. We can take it offline and talk about it, but you do not disclose patient information publicly here. Now, if a school chooses to say whether it's a, is, if it's a staff member or a student, that's up to the school. It has not come out of the health department. So in this case, we don't know what, the case that you're citing, we don't know what the school has said. We are telling you that there are two people within, I think, the Montpelier Roxbury School District, and we aren't discussing whether they're students or um, whether they're students or staff. We can, t we can discuss um, the information that you're saying that HIPAA has been blown out of the water. Let's discuss that. No, that's, that's great. We've asked multiple times and have not heard once from the health department. So, uh, uh, and, and we, I think we've shared the articles, legal journals, whatever. Uh, so, uh, got no response. So, I'll wait for their response. Thank you, Mike. Aaron Patenko. Thank you very much. Aaron Patenko, VT Digger. Hi. Uh, the Agency of Education might chime in as well. As we discuss these uh, school cases and the first evidence of school based transmission so far, the Health Department website is still reporting cases as of last Friday. So it doesn't include any of the cases reported at the last press conference or today's press conference. And that's creating a lot of confusion. I mean, we're getting kind of feedback from readers who are confused about how many total cases there have been in schools and how many active cases there in schools. Even journalists who follow these press conferences every week were arguing uh, in my Twitter feed on Tuesday trying to figure out exactly what the total number of schools are that have been affected. Are there any plans to kind of update that PDF more frequently or um, the PDF of, of school cases more frequently or convert it into a different format perhaps so that it's a little more clear what schools are affected uh, week to week? Or is this kind of all we can expect for the future? I think Dr. Kelso may have an answer for you. Yeah, just so everyone's aware, um, that um, PDF, um, which looks like a table, which lists all the schools in Vermont um, that have 25 or more in attendance and um, the number of cases, that is updated weekly. It's updated on Monday morning, and it only includes the cases reported through the preceding Friday. So it's always going to be a little bit behind. Um, and it's not meant to be a real-time you know, snapshot of what we've got going on. It's meant more to um, you know, fully disclose the number of cases we've had at schools while they were potentially infectious. Um, if there's a need for additional information, we can, we can look at how the health department might be able to provide that. But again, you know, HIPAA may really prohibit or um, limit what we're allowed to share and with what frequency and um, in how much detail. Um, so I apologize that you're not finding that table useful. We don't currently have any plans to update it more frequently than every Monday morning including that has data through the preceding Friday. The reason for the Friday to Monday delay is, um, you know, if a case comes in on Saturday or Sunday, we're not likely going to have all the information we need in order to say whether it was um, someone who was in a building while they were during their infectious period. So um, in order to have the information be accurate, we're including cases through the preceding Friday. Uh, 
Well, hold on. So um, the cases that are reported on the PDF or, you know, on the website, do they only include people who are in the building? Yes, they only include, and, and this is um, specified in the header that's right on that table. They only include cases that were potentially in school or at school while they were infectious. So if, for example, um, a um, household contact, um, let's say there's an adult who's positive and they have a school-aged child at home. Um, if that school-aged child is in quarantine, so not going to school, and then becomes a case, they would not be included in that table because they were not at school at all while they were infectious. They were in quarantine at home. Or if a, school, if a child is um, doing fully remote learning, again, they wouldn't have been in school at all while they were potentially infectious, so they would not be included in that table. Yeah, I probably got told this and, and temporarily blanked on that information. But could that create a situation where, like, a school is reporting a case voluntarily on their website, but the Department of Health isn't included or reported out? Um, is that kind of why some, in some cases, we're hearing about cases from schools? Like, I think Essex reported a case last earlier this week, but it wasn't mentioned in the press conference. Is that why there's kind of contradicting information that we're getting? Yeah, it could very well be, and it, that will likely be the case um, from time to time, because a school may be aware of a case, and even if that case was not at, at school at all while they were infectious, um, you know, through the nature of Vermont and our small towns, um, people may in fact know about that case and have concerns. So schools may put out information just to show that they're aware of a situation. Um, and to calm any, any concern. Um, but that doesn't mean that a case was necessarily potentially infectious in school, and it doesn't mean it's going to be counted on our table on our health website. OK, I, I understand. Um, I think that's about it on our somebody else has thoughts or would like to comment. I don't think so, Aaron. Um. So, any follow-ups or? Uh, no, thank you. All right. Guide page. Governor, I was calling in when you may have discussed this question with another reporter, so please bear with me. You and four other governors yesterday asked ISO New England, the regional power grid operator, for a decarbonized grid. In March, ISO President Gordon Van Willey said carbon pricing is the best way to help states reach their carbon goals, but said there needs to be consensus among the states. Uh, will you and the four other governors be asking for carbon pricing on wholesale power purchases? Um, that wasn't the, uh, the intent of the letter uh, at this point in time, so um, we'll, we'll just have to react to that in the future. It's more about the, the grid and so forth. So what, what, what's the, the ask then for what you, what you want ISO to do? But in, from my standpoint, uh, it's about uh, making sure we're prepared uh, for uh, the demand uh, that will undoubtedly happen uh, due to the electrification of vehicles, electrification of heating devices, um, and, uh, and, and so forth over uh, the next coming uh, decade or two uh, as we move towards a carbonless society. So. We just, uh, the demand is going to uh, be tremendous. We just have to make sure that we have the infrastructure prepared to, uh, to accommodate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, I was just told moments ago by a conservative Republican nominee for the legislature, uh, he, quote, Tuesday morning, my Facebook account was disabled, no reason given, no message, no email, nothing. Didn't know if other conservative voices in the state had experienced the same thing. This is someone who's been active in opposing BLM flags in the district. H have you heard of any instances like this happening in Vermont and it becomes a pattern? Is it something that you'd be willing to uh, approach Facebook on? 
I have not uh, encountered that and uh, have not heard of anything like that. Um, in some respects, uh, Facebook has been both a blessing and a curse. Um, maybe, maybe the best thing is to just shut down Facebook in its entirety. That might be helpful. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what, what do you suggest to Vermonters, who, especially political candidates? You know, it's hard to go door to door. Social media, how things are done. Um, what, what do you suggest that they do when they're frozen out of their social media account? Well, again, um, you can go back to more traditional methods. I guess uh, you can call people. Uh, you can take out ads in newspapers, as I have. Uh, you can uh, use uh, the media uh, for other in other ways. Um, and uh, and I'm sure I don't know if they've uh, uh, been unable to use uh, Facebook for um, advertising or not. But uh, that's always a, a method as well. But uh, there are other ways of getting your message out. Um, again, I don't know the particulars of this uh, of this incident. And I have not heard of anyone else uh, having uh, having that experience. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it. That's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you on Tuesday uh, for more modeling and uh, probably an update on the uh, the hockey situation as well. Thank you very much.